I wonder, as we prepare for Christmas, this Advent series, I wonder what you kind of reflect on Christmas. I, I know there are some among us that are big fans of Christmas. We love the Christmas season. We love that build-up to Christmas, the excitement of Christmas Day. But for other, uh, others of us, maybe Christmas is a hard time. It's a time in which we reflect on, on maybe family members that are no longer with us. It's a time in which we maybe... Um, we feel lonely, maybe, and maybe a bit isolated. Christmas can stir so many different emotions in us, can't they? And often dependent on, on our experiences of Christmas. Well, it's been famously said that the Christmas story is the greatest story ever told. And I don't know whether you have a favorite story. Mine as a child was Narnia. I used to love the Narnia stories. In fact, you would often find me on an evening when I should be asleep in bed, under my covers, with a torch on, reading Narnia in bed. I, I love the, the, the stories, imagining myself in those worlds, fighting the White Witch, um, being a king of Narnia. Um, it, was, it was amazing to be captured by them. A, a sign of a truly great story, is it, is one that we can't put down, that we just want to keep on reading. Um, I wonder what that is for you, whether you've got a story that you particularly relate to, whether it's a film or a, or a book. And a great story takes us on a journey, doesn't it? It takes us on a journey where it takes us from beginning to an end in which we can relate to, in which we can understand. And every year at Christmas, we come to this same story, the Christmas story. And every year, we have this same story that's told, often at, Christ, uh, at children's nativity plays. We have the, the, the characters that we normally get. We have Mary and Joseph. We have the shepherds. We have the sheep. Uh, we have the wise men. And of course, we have the baby Jesus. And famously, George Stevens titled this story, The Greatest Story Ever Told. But if we're honest, it all feels a bit familiar, doesn't it? Every year, the same old story of a baby that came that was born in a manger. It's the same story. And it can become almost too familiar to us. It can almost become a bit mundane. It can almost lose the magic of the story. But here's the difference between the stories that we may love for ourselves and this story. You see, when we work, read great works of fiction, and when we read even stories of maybe great men and women that we admire and we read their biographies, this is God's story. And at the very heart of this story is a journey that is like no other, of how the light of the world came into our world, how God himself stepped into humanity. And we, this morning, are going to spend a little bit of time looking at this story, and I want us this morning to be captured afresh by the beauty and the wonder of the Christmas story. And we're going to be looking at it through this lens of what we've been looking at in our Advent series, and this is the lens of Jesus being the light of the world and specifically, we're going to look at it this morning of him being the light that rescues. If you've got a Bible, I'd love you to open it to 1 Peter and chapter 2. 1 Peter and chapter 2. And we're going to read, it's going to be on the screen behind me as well, we're going to read from verses 9 and 10. And Peter writes this, But you are a chosen race a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may reclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are a people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. M many of the stories that we love contain this idea, don't they, of darkness and light. I don't know whether we've got any Star Wars fans in the room, but there is that theme, isn't there, in all the great stories, whether it's fairy tales or whether it's Star Wars or whatever story it is of this darkness, of this evil, 
and of goodness and light. And the darkness and evil in the stories that we love often tries to, to, to try and take people, bring them into the darkness, whether that is through cunning or whether that is through force. And the reason that these stories, I think, resonate with us so much is because they relate to us and, and our own world and our own experiences. We just have to look around us, don't we, in the world that we live in. And we can see the darkness. The world is not as it should be. We even have to just look in our, our own homes and our own hearts. And we can see that things are not as they should be. We see the brokenness. We see our sin. But it is also the story of the Bible. The reason that those stories resonate with us is because this is the Bible story of good and evil, of darkness and light. And we're going to start our journey this morning by looking at this idea of the darkness that hides us. And we're going to start all the way back in Genesis. I want you to imagine a paradise on earth. A world full of light and full of goodness. And in this world of light and goodness lives a man and lives a woman. The first man and the first woman. And it's a world full of joy. There's no friction between this man and woman. In fact, they have this perfect marital relationship. It's like all those films from Disney, but better. Adam always treats Eve like a princess. He never forgets to wash the dishes or mow the lawn. He never forgets to pick her flowers. He is the perfect husband, ladies. And in this world, guys, Eve is the perfect wife. She's always supportive of Adam. She always listens to him. She tells him how handsome he is. Not that there's much competition. It's an amazing world. And Adam and Eve not only have a perfect relationship with each other, they also have a perfect relationship with God. A perfect relationship with God, their creator. And there's no darkness in sight. Imagine that. No darkness in sight. It's a world full of light. And as we watch him, we're meant to get this sense, as we read the beginning of Genesis, of joy of unbridled joy. This is what it means to live in the presence of God, to, to be able to commune with Him, to be in relationship with Him. No suffering, no sadness, no sin. Just joy. But that perfect picture, as we look in quickly, changes. Like a mirror that shatters as we meet the serpent, and the serpent creeps in and darkness creeps in. And he deceives Adam and he deceives Eve. And the one and the only one thing that God told Adam and Eve not to do, they go and do. And they stop believing the truth of God's word. And they believe the lies of Satan. And they disobey God and they eat from the one tree that God told them not to. And we're meant to cry out as we read the narrative, why? Why would you ruin it? Why? Why would you do this? Why would you do the one thing that God told you not to do? Look at, look at your Bibles. You can, the, the, the verses will be on, behind me on the, on, the, on the screen. Genesis 3, verses 7 to 8. And we'll see the consequences of that action. They've just eaten the fruit. And this is what happens, uh, Genesis 3, verse 7. Then the eyes of both, that's Adam and Eve, were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. No longer are they able to even see the beauty of the paradise that they're in? Do you see that? They can no longer see the beauty of the world around them and the beauty of one another. Their eyes were open. 
but they are no longer seeing the world through that perfect relationship with God. They now see the world through their guilt and their shame. And do you know what they try and do? <laughs> they do what we do. <laughs> they try and hide. They want to hide their shame. And they want to take themselves further into the darkness. They hide their bodies and they hide from God. And the consequences of their actions suddenly dawn on us. Their relationship is no longer perfect. They're scared. And the paradise that they were once living in has become a nightmare. But not only is their relationship broken between Adam and Eve, now they have destroyed their relationship with God. That perfect relationship. And we are meant to, as we read the opening pages of Genesis, we are meant to feel despair. That's where we're meant to be. And if we're honest with ourselves, we would have been no different to Adam or Eve. How often do we stop believing the Word of God? How often do we turn from it and trust ourselves rather than trust Him? How often do we believe the lies of the enemy? How often do we believe the lies of the world? We think that our way is better than God's way. You know, Christmas can be an amazing time, can't it? But we can get lost in the occasion and we can find ourselves finding value and worth in things rather than the one that came and gave us the greatest gift of all. You see, the fruit that they ate looked good. It wasn't that they ate a moldy piece of fruit. It looked good. But with it, it brought darkness and destruction for both Adam and Eve, but also for humanity. Here's a question for us this morning. What is it in our life that looks good but actually brings darkness and death. What is it? What are the things that we know we are pursuing that God tells us are not good? Maybe it's a TV show that you wouldn't even want members of your church to know that you're watching. <laughs> Certainly not your parents. <laughs> let alone Jesus. What conversations do you reflect on over the last month that you are embarrassed <laughs> that you even entertained? What lies in this world are you pursuing and believing? What activities are you doing purposely that you know are not good, even if they look good. For Adam and Eve, as they listen to the lies of Satan, sin comes into this world. And God does the only thing that God can do, and he kicks them out of the garden. He kicks them out into the darkness. Because of their sin, they're no longer able to be in the presence of God. They're no longer able to be in this paradise, this world of light. And darkness has come into the world. And we only have to turn a few pages. Isn't this interesting? The first human death is murder. Is murder. And as we look around this world, still to this day, it's broken. Ever since that moment in time, the world has been broken. A world full of broken, sinful people living in darkness. And that is much of the story of the Old Testament. We see people continually disobeying God. God shows kindness and grace and people turn the other way. They go their own way. In fact, as a church, we looked at this series in Nehemiah. And in Nehemiah chapter 9, we see this, this moment in which they reflect on, on their history, the people of God. 
the last book probably written in the Old Testament from the first book in Genesis. And we see them reflecting on their, on their time as the people of God and looking back in their history. And this is what they realize. Read with me. It's on the screen behind. Nehemiah 9, 16 to 19. And this is the people reflecting as they repent and confess their sins. But they are fathers acted presumptuously and stiffened their neck and did not obey your commandments. They refused to obey and were not mindful of the wonders that you performed among them. And they stiffened their neck and appointed a leader to return to their slavery in Egypt. They were looking back to a time in Exodus where the people, even though God had rescued them from their enemy, the people turned their back upon the God that rescued them. They turned their back upon God's goodness and his kindness and they disobeyed his word. And we continue to read Nehemiah chapter 9, 26 to 27. Once again, as history repeats itself, nevertheless they were disobedient and rebelled against you and cast your law behind their back and they killed your prophets who had warned them in order to turn them back to you and they committed great blasphemies. Therefore you gave to them into the hands of their enemies who made them suffer. Keep reading on to verse 28. It says this once again. Here's the repeat again of, of the people's behavior. But after they had had rest, <laughs> they did evil again before you. And, and you abandoned them to the hands of their enemies. So they had dominion over them. The people continually, time and time and time and time again, they continually walk away from God, walking in darkness, walking in their sins. And if we're honest, if we're really, really honest this morning, Cornerstone, we can be just the same. We so often choose our way rather than God's. We so often live about the desires of, of what we want to do and, and our life. And we so often try and find true satisfaction in the things of this world rather than finding satisfaction in God himself. We even turn, in our sin, we even turn good things, don't we? Good gifts from God, like family and houses and jobs and money and food and relationships, and we make them the ultimate thing and we worship those things. And we so often then, when we turn up to church on a Sunday or GCE in midweek, we then put this show on to show everyone the best version of ourselves. So people don't see the real us. And we sit and we hide in the darkness. It becomes easier to miss church or not hang out with GCE or Christian friends who will maybe point out the fact that we are at times walking in that darkness, point out our sin. How many of us use the excuse, I do, of hiding in the busyness of our lives and our jobs and our works and our careers? How many of us use the excuse of when we've got sin to deal with or confront, we, we sit in front of that TV screen or our phone just to hide away from the reality of what we actually need to think about and focus on? How many of us hide from the community when we're, we're not at our best? How many of us in the workplace <laughs> hide our faith because we care more about what people think than what God thinks? And we all, every single one of us, has this habit of hiding the parts of our life, don't we, that we want no one to see. And maybe this morning... <laughs> We're a bit more like Israel than we realize. And maybe like Adam and Eve, you're feeling hopeless <laughs> and you're wanting to hide. Maybe you're feeling broken in the darkness. Maybe you're feeling crushed by your sin and your shame. And I think sometimes as we reflect on our sin and our lives and our walk, <sighs> ever had that week? Oh, I did it again. I messed up again. And like Israel, <laughs> it's, like a, 
It's like a video that you're watching over and over and over again. Well, here's the glimmer of hope in our story. The great thing about the Bible story is it doesn't leave us in the darkness, but it gives us hope. And our next part of the journey is a glimmer of hope. When, when Naomi, uh, Naomi is our eldest daughter, when we had our Naomi, um, Esther decided that it would be good for us as a family to get a blackout blind to put on our window so that we could sleep in darkness. Well, not us. Naomi could sleep in darkness. So she's like, this is how babies sleep. It's going to be a dark room. It would be better for us sleeping. Now, 10 years later, four house moves later, we still sleep in darkness because we still have that blackout blind on our window and Naomi does not sleep in our bedroom. <laughs> now, when I don't know if anyone's, if anyone's slept in a pitch black room, but the first time I experienced this, it's quite disorientating, particularly when you wake up to a screaming child that you've never had before. And I would get out of bed and I literally had no clue where I was, my bearings. So it was often that Esther would hear me getting out of bed to get to know me, walking into the wall, walking into the radio, walking into the bedside table, not having a clue of actually where Naomi was in the bedroom. And it was often not just Naomi screaming, it was me screaming too. And, and this can be us, isn't it, in our sin sometimes. We, we, can, we see no way out. It's obvious, Right? We feel so deep in our sin. We, we can see the darkness. And we are completely disorientated and we don't know what to do. But do you know what happened over time? Over time, this is what happened. Amazingly, I started to learn to walk around in the darkness and to find my bearings. I started to be able to get up in the night and go to a baby in the pitch black. And that can be us too. We can become so used to our sin, we can become so accustomed to our sin that we almost even forget that the darkness is there. And I don't know where you are this morning. Maybe you are like, oh, I can see the darkness. I know I'm in darkness. You feel disorientated, you feel terrified. Or maybe this morning you come here and you're not even really aware that you're in the darkness at all. So what hope is there in the midst of the darkness? What hope is there on our journey? What hope is there in the midst of our own sin and our own walk? Well, God speaks... Go all the way back to Genesis. God speaks hope into a hopeless situation. I want us to see this. Adam and Eve wouldn't have even realized this as God spoke, but God speaks hope even in the midst of pouring out his judgment upon them. And here is God speaking. In Genesis chapter 3, he's speaking to the serpent. This is what God says. And he says in Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. And he shall bruise your head, uh, and you shall bruise his heel. It's a very strange (laughs) verse. But what does it mean? This is what it means. It means a promise of a rescuer. The promise of one that would come and crush the serpent's head. You see, the hope of Christmas is that even through the mess of our lives, Even though we are sinners that have failed to meet God's standards, God promises a rescuer. A rescuer that will deal with darkness and sin once and for all. A one that would come and defeat the darkness and the sin and the evil forever. And that promise is made even clearer in as God speaks to the prophet Isaiah. Chris took us uh, to this passage um, few weeks ago. Isaiah 9, if you turn with it, uh, and it'll be on the screen behind me, Isaiah 9, and verses, we're going to look at verses 2 and 3. This is God's promise. It says this, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. 
You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy of the harvest, and they are glad when they divide the spoil. You see, see, at the time, what was happening was God was telling Isaiah about the coming judgment upon the people of God. That they were going to be judged for their own sins, for, for walking away, not trusting in God's word. And God had warned Isaiah that the people had become like Egypt. They'd become like the people in which God had rescued them from. They were, they were no longer worshipping him, but foreign gods. And they had lost their first love. But in the midst of all of this, there is hope. In the midst of darkness, God says, light will come. And this is good news, not just for the people, but this is good news for us. Rescue will come. And the, and the Bible is clear. We are unable to rescue ourselves. We are walking in darkness without hope. And because of our sin, God is right to one day punish us for our sin. And that pain and that hurt that we have caused to both ourselves and to others, one day we will have to give an account for that in front of a holy God. But the Bible also speaks hope. Hope of a potential rescue that's going to come. A rescuer who's going to come. Hope of one who will come and stand in our place. Who will take on sin and deal with it once and for all. Who will defeat the darkness. How? How? Because he's the light, the light that will come. The people of God were waiting for the light that was going to come, the serpent crusher who was going to come. And they were waiting for one who was going to be the king that would bring that light. And we know this because if we keep reading in Isaiah 9, it says this, Isaiah 9 verses 6 and 7, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful God, uh, sorry, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. And on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. You see, as God speaks to Isaiah, he gives, them, he gives Isaiah this little insight on who this might be that will bring this light into the world. And he tells him that the one that will come will bring both justice and righteousness forever, forever. And he will bring everlasting peace. As we think back to that world of paradise, that world of light in the garden, what God is promising is that one day, one is going to come and he's going to bring that world of light back. And he's going to bring it back, not just for a time, but forever more. And the one that's going to come is going to get rid of darkness once and for all. But when? When is that going to happen? You see, when we got to the end of Nehemiah, right, there was 400 years of silence for the people of God. 400 years of nothing, not hearing from God. And the people must have felt, as the Roman Empire arrived and took over Israel, and, and they lived in oppression, they must have felt that they were in darkness. But there was hope. Hope because of God's word. Hope because of this prophecy. Hope because there was going to be a child, a baby who was going to come. So as we get to Luke 2 and the Christmas story, how does God reveal his rescuer? How is this baby going to be revealed? On the screen behind me, read Luke 2 verse 8. I love this. And in the same region... There were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. You see, God doesn't reveal his coming to, to nobles or to kings or to priests. He doesn't reveal his coming to the wealthy or the famous. The shepherds were the outcasts of society. But what's more striking as we think about the light of the world coming in, 
Where are the shepherds? They're in a field at night. At night. They are sat in the darkness. <laughs> Literal darkness. And it is as God reveals through the angels to them. Let's keep reading in the darkness. Um, verse 9. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them. Are you ready for this? And the glory of the Lord shone <laughs> around them. And they were filled with great fear. And the angel said, fear not, for I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there with the angels was a multitude of heaven's hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from into heaven, the angels said, sorry, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the same that they had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered. Of what the shepherds told them. Picture this scene. You're the outcast of society, sat in a miserable job at night time, protecting your sheep, and in the darkness, the light appears. The angels appear. Into the hopelessness comes a message of hope. And the angels tell us, don't they, that they bring a message not just of light, but of great joy, good news. The, the wonder of the Christmas story is that on that first Christmas day, the light had come. The angels make that clear. He has come. And he'd come not in splendor, not in a palace, not in a castle. Where was he? In an animal feeding trough. There's nothing special or unique about Jesus' physical appearance. He wasn't glowing like some of the nativity stories show. But imagine as those shepherds crowded around that little baby with their very own eyes for the very first time they got to see the light of the world. 400 years of silence and very child laying before them was the hope had come. The hope of rescue had arrived. And that leads us to our final stop on our, on our journey, the light that rescues. You see, the story of Jesus' life continues. <laughs> and as he grows up and his life and his ministry, and we eventually, at the end of Luke, we get to his death. And in Luke 23, verses 44 to 46, it will be on the screen behind me, it says this. It was now about the sixth hour and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. At Christmas, don't we? We stop and we remember the birth of Jesus, of God becoming flesh, of him coming to this world. But it is his death that we fully see why his birth actually mattered. You see, God's promise of a rescuer who would deal with darkness once and for all, all those hundreds of years before Jesus' birth. And that rescue came true on the cross. On the cross, Jesus took all our junk, all our darkness, all our sin, all our mess upon himself. In fact, once again, we see this physical sign of darkness. Darkness fell over the world, even though it was the middle of the day. And in that moment, in that moment, the perfect one, the, the Son of God, the light of the world, 
God poured out his judgment and his wrath upon him. The reason that the Christmas message matters is because that baby was going to grow up and live a perfect life. He was going to heal the sick. He was going to feed the multitude. But one day, his purpose was to die. To die for you. In the midst of the presents and the stockings and the meal, realize that Christmas is a message of rescue. That our junk, that our sin, that our mess, put Jesus upon that cross. Do you see? The Son of God. How do we miss this? The Son of God came into this world to bring us hope because he took the darkness. He took the judgment. He was beaten. He was spat upon. And he was crucified upon a Roman cross. And the Father pours out the judgment and the punishment that we deserve, that I deserve. This is why it is the greatest story ever told. Because I don't know whether you notice in the midst of that picture, something amazing happens. The curtain in the temple was torn into two. You see, the curtain was the place in which the high priest would go once a year. It separated the presence of God from the people because people weren't allowed into his presence. Darkness wasn't allowed in the presence of God. And as Jesus dies, that curtain is torn in two. You see, what God was doing in that moment was he was telling us that no longer do you get to me through a curtain. Now you come to me through my son. Jesus had made a way. I love the imagery of the Bible and I, and I truly believe that this is important. Three days later, what time of day was it when the women came to find come to see Jesus' body. It was early in the morning as the sun was rising. The sun was rising. Why? Because the Son of God had risen. You see the significance? Jesus had dealt with darkness once and for all. He was in the darkness of a tomb and now he was alive and standing, and the sun was rising as the sun had risen. He had conquered death. He had conquered darkness. He had conquered Satan. And that same Jesus is now seated on a throne. And, and, and one day he's going to establish his kingdom, his kingdom of life, of light that will have peace and prosperity. And we, if we are trusted in him, will one day be with him in that kingdom of light forever, forever. It's the greatest story ever told. That we, broken, sinful people, people that have not listened to God's world, that have walked away from him, can one day be with him, just like Adam and Eve were in the garden. For Adam and Eve, that wasn't permanent. Sin came into the world. Darkness came into the world. But for us, if we are trusting in King Jesus, we will be with him forever and ever and ever. No wonder we need to be reminded of the light of the world that came to rescue us. And that's why Peter reminds us. Let's read it again. 1 Peter 2, 9 to 10. But you are a chosen race, 
a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. You see, in the midst of whatever you're feeling this Christmas, there is hope. Hope. Once we were in darkness, and now if we're trusting in Jesus, we are in light. But Peter doesn't stop with just the word light. Do you see what he says? I love this. It's his marvelous light. It's his marvelous light. Whatever you're feeling this morning, whether you're feeling shame and hopeless, whether you're feeling weighed down by your sin, whether you're maybe hopeful and excited about Christmas, know this, his light is marvellous. It's marvellous. Why is it marvellous? Because in it we receive grace and mercy. In it we no longer have to live in darkness, but we get to live and walk in his light. What does it mean to live in his light? Well, Peter tells us, he says this, he says, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. You see, once we were in darkness and we were living for ourselves, that's who we were before we were Christians. Now, Peter says, you are God's people, living for him and his glory. You see, we are a people, Cornerstone, We're not just a bunch of individuals. We're a people. United in him, living for him. And we're to live that in the context of being family. Living for him. Walking with each other in that. Jesus tells us, doesn't he? He says we're to be like the city on a hill. A light on a hill. Displaying and showing the world the light of Jesus. So our lives now are no longer ones that reflect ourselves. And our desires, they are to display and show him to the world. So we live in the light of his word, in the truth of his word. And we share this news that the angels shared with the shepherds of good news, of great joy, of this marvelous life with those who do not know it. And daily we need to remind each other of that light. And finally, Peter also reminds us this. He said, once you had received mercy, but sorry, once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So we are to show and demonstrate the mercy of God to each other. We are to show and demonstrate that mercy to the world that doesn't know him. We're called to forgive as he has forgiven us. We're to confess and bring our sin into the light. And we're to show mercy and grace when our brothers and sisters do that to us. We're to love and serve one another as a church. We're to practically, practically demonstrate the mercy of God in our daily lives. And we're to remind each other that as we fail, and we will fail, to come back into his mercy and his grace and into his marvelous light. So this Christmas, in the midst of your Christmas dinner, in the midst of the stockings and the presents and the tree, wherever you find yourself this Christmas, remember this. Christmas is marvelous because the light of the world came to rescue us. The greatest gift we can receive this Christmas is not the the item that we've chosen on our Amazon wish list. (laughs) It's him. It's the light of the world. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you. We thank you for Christmas. We thank you that you sent your son into this world. You sent your son into this world to rescue us. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you that you came to rescue us. We thank you that you that you came and you lived that perfect life. But we thank you also that you died on the cross 
because that was your great rescue plan to take the darkness, to take the sin, to take the judgment of the Father upon yourself. Holy Spirit, help us this morning as, as we respond to this, as we, as we reflect and as we work up to Christmas. Father, even help us this afternoon as, as we, we think and reflect on our carol service this evening. Give us the boldness as the people of God to go and invite our friends that don't know this light to come and to hear about your marvelous light. Father, I pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen.